I'm not a marine scientist. Uh, in fact, I started my journey in science as an aerospace engineer. And some of you might wonder, uh, did I get lost along the way, you know? Um, but in fact, the ocean is the next frontier. Um, let me tell you a story about how my life had changed very quickly. One day when my advisor in graduate school, uh, John DeBerry at Caltech, came into my office. Um, and he actually came to my office looking pretty dejected um, and concerned. And he came up to me and was like, hey, Connie, I have an idea. I can't seem to sell it to anyone else in the research group. Um, and, you know, I've asked everyone else in the group if they would be interested in at least working on it, and I, it, no one's interested. And, and so I was like, okay, John, what is it? Let me know um, what, you're, what you're thinking. And he said that he had this idea to study jellyfish swimming with, again, jellyfish biologists Jack Costello and, and Sean Colin. And as most of you are familiar with jellyfish, when you think about them, the very first thing you think about are its tentacles, right? these lovely, beautiful things that extend from the body of a jellyfish or the bell. Um, when in fact, I am more interested in that bell. It's the um, repetitive motion of the contraction and the relaxation of these muscles on this animal that actually generates forward motion. And a common method that scientists and, and biologists have used to try and understand how animals swim is by using dye or dye visualizations. And so what you're seeing is a pipette actually filled with milk, and it's, uh, the dye is placed inside the subumbrella cavity of the jellyfish. And as the, animals con or as the muscles contract on these animals, fluid is expelled very quickly into the wake of the animal. And so I'm a fluid mechanician, and the thing that I get really excited about are these structures that are ejected from the body of the animal. These are called vortex rings. How many of you have flushed a toilet? Basically, if you just take that whirlpool of fluid, you, you take the, the, the starting end and the finishing end and you attach it to each other, that is a vortex ring. And so we fluid mechanicians get really excited about those because all animals, when they swim, they generate these vortex rings. As an engineer, what I'm interested in is not like pretty pictures, although they're very nice. I'm interested in quantities that I can measure or, or use to understand energetic inputs swimming efficiencies, you know, other performance metrics that are relevant to an engineered design. And so what we had to do was kind of step up the ante and, and use a technique um, that's normally used in a laboratory to study um, and measure the velocity of fluid that is um, due to an animal swimming. And so this is an example of what a setup would look like in the laboratory. Um, and in order to study a motion of fluid, Obviously, we need a tank. And um, within this tank, you can place anything you want. It could be an animal. Um, it could be anything that you're interested in. And unfortunately, with water, right, it's transparent. So you have to add particles that are suspended in the water column or in the tank. And so by motion of these particles, you can actually infer motion of fluid. Right, so that you have now particles, you have fluid, but now you need something to illuminate it. And so I get the awesome job of getting to work with lasers. Okay, I'm an engineer. Remember, I get really excited about lasers. And, and so um, next to a, a laser is a high-speed camera. Uh, some of these organisms we work with, uh, we have to capture frames at 1,000 frames per second. And um, what we're then getting or generating are these consecutive images of particles moving in time. And by using that information, we can get the following. So what you're seeing is a velocity field um, that was measured around a jellyfish known as Phyllorhiza in a laboratory. And so what you have, a, it's a little difficult to see, but in the background of this um, image, you have these white particles, right? So those are the particles that have actually been added to this tank. And then what the arrows represent is the direction and speed that the fluid is moving due to this animal swimming. And so here, the arrowheads can indicate direction, and the color, actually, from blue to red, indicates low to high speeds. And so using this information, we can then back out those quantities that I'm interested in as an engineer. You're, you're faced with this challenge of trying to work on animals 
and using these sorts of techniques, but in limited environments, right? And so one of the things that I spent my first three years in graduate school working on was developing um, a way to miniaturize these very complex laboratory measurements into something a single scuba diver can use, right? And here is the solution. Um, it's the self-contained underwater velocimetry apparatus, or SCUVA. And so what it is, is essentially is um, here you have a video camera housing, and this is actually all consumer-based products, right? Attached to the camera housing, you have these HID lights, which provide white light, so when you're diving, you can actually see what you're doing. Um, and then attached to the camera housing is a laser housing. Um, and so in combination with this, a single scuba diver can swim to whatever target they're interested in and get these kinds of measurements. So that could be an animal, that could be flow over a coral reef, that could be measuring filtration rates of, um, of sponges to try and monitor health. And so what this means is then we now open up the world of these velocity measurements from the laboratory into anything we want in the field. And so this here is a video to just kind of put you in the same you know, frame of mind I am when I'm doing these measurements. Um, so this, obviously these measurements have to be done at night because you are using a laser. And these green lights uh, indicate separate divers in the water column. I just need to point out that that's me. And we're right now in the Adriatic Sea. We're about 100 feet in, in depth. And um, you're also far away from shore. Um, and so the first thing we do is turn on these white lights and we get some very simple data on trying to understand how fast these animals swim, what is their behavior. And this particular jellyfish called Solmissus is very different in that when they swim around, their tentacles are located in front of their body instead of behind it. And then once we get that data, we then turn off those white lights and then turn on the laser. And when that happens, it's magic. Because what you can see, right, are these particle displacements, and that's solely due to this animal swimming. All right, so now we have this really awesome tool. And a question that I became really interested in very soon after developing this was something that was really relevant not only to the biology, but also to the environment that these organisms live in. And it's related to the general circulation of the oceans. Um, and so this is a simulation uh, conducted by NASA that shows the, the, the general circulation or the general currents that go on, on in our oceans. And you'll notice very quickly, it's not just a single ocean that has currents, it, it's global, it's everywhere. These oceans are all connected. And now oceanographers have spent a lot of time trying to understand these currents and also understand how do we maintain these currents, right? External power or external source of, ener of energy must be added to our ocean system in order to maintain it. And then another aspect of the work is one, trying to understand how much of this energy is required to maintain these currents. And then two, what are these sources of energy? And so when we think about this, and this is a, a widely accepted idea in the oceanographic community, is that winds and tides make up the majority of the energetic inputs to ocean mixing. But a recent idea, and trust me, it's very unpopular with the oceanographic community, is whether or not swimming animals um, migrating in mass will have an impact on the fluid environment, be able to contribute to mixing in the oceans. And it's not my idea. In fact, it was first proposed by famous oceanographer Walter Monk. It was at least mentioned. And, and myself and some other scientists that have become very interested in this idea um, believe that there is a potential for this to occur because of the vast number of organisms in the ocean. Um, so the diurnal vertical migrations that happen in the ocean every single day are the largest biomass movement of organisms on our planet. And we don't know that much about them. So Mark Baumgartner was very kind enough to allow me to use his, um, his image that shows the motion of copepods in the fluid column. So how many of you know what a copepod is? 
Wow, okay, even less. So do you know uh, that copepods are known as the ants of the ocean? Okay, largest biomass um, in, actually on the planet. So the reason why these animals migrate is, is they do so to avoid being eaten. Um, these organisms, because they're so small, and this includes copepods as well as other small fish, they stay down in the depths of the ocean and then at, during the day and then at night go up to the surface to feed. And then once they're done feeding, they then return to the depths of the ocean and um, repeat the cycle. Okay, this is a daily cycle. Um, and so if we think about how small copepods are, so they're about a millimeter in diameter, this is a, a, a pencil tip. One of the things I want to point out is that these organisms, at least in this example, are migrating 150 meters each way. And there are reports of um, these animals migrating anywhere between 200 meters to 500 meters in each direction. Now, why is this important? It's because these animals that are so small, in one day, the relative distance that a wildebeest migrates in a year is the same distance these copepods traverse every single day. And we don't know anything about it. We don't know much about it. And so it's not just um, copepods that do this. It also includes krill. Um, krill um, are obviously eaten by whales, but then also jellyfish. Jellyfish also vertically migrate. And in fact, Solmysis, that one animal I showed you in the Adriatic, um, has, has been known to um, travel one kilometer in each direction. And so my contribution to this biogenic mixing work is trying to identify how these animals actually mix water. Um, and so what you see here, again, in this dive visualization, this is uh, a Palauan jellyfish known as Mystigius. And uh, what you can see with the dive visualizations are two different things. So one, you have, with every contraction and relaxation cycle, you have, again, these sexy structures called vortex rings in the wake. But then right behind the organism, what you also see is this large volume of fluid that's being dragged along behind its body. It's being drifted along. And it's this mechanism that can allow for large-scale mixing by these migrating organisms. What I want to tell you is a little bit about where these studies are going. Um, it's not just in the topic of biogenic mixing. It also applies to other fields entirely. Um, these fields include, obviously, oceanography, ecology, and biology, and engineering. Um, in oceanography, there's this idea that, you know, if swimming animals are contributing to our currents, isn't that something we should know? Um, so there are scientists looking into that, including myself. Um, in biology or in ecology, there's this idea that if these animals are migrating from nutrient-rich fluid up to the surface to feed, which can be nutrient-poor, and they're transporting all of this fluid upwards, they're actually able to fertilize their feeding grounds. Crazy. And then in engineering, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. In fact, I'm doing some work in this area now, is trying to learn from the biology to design something that we can use underwater or in anything. And so just to say and, and summarize all these ideas in that the frontiers of science right now lies in the intersections of these fields. And it requires you know, thinkers, people from other disciplines, to work together and figure out ways to communicate with each other to really be able to answer these difficult and challenging problems. I want to leave you with an idea, a question. And there is no way we're going to answer this tonight. Um, but the question is, can swimming animals affect our world? Um, so imagine, you know, what if the whales decided to stop swimming? Or what if somehow, unfortunately, they get removed from the ocean? You know, how do you think that's going to affect what's going on? Not only in the biology, but also what's happening physically to our world. What happens if we remove apex predators in our oceans, right? These animals, these small animals that are vertically migrating, they're doing it because they're avoiding being eaten. So if you move those predators, what if they don't continue vertically migrating? And then if these animals aren't migrating, what happens if um, you don't have this fertilization of, of, of uh, you know, the food base in the, web, uh, in the ocean? And, and so these are concepts that we really need to think about. You know, it's the big picture ideas. It's, it's really understanding how things are connected in the ocean, on, on, on the surface, um, on land and, and in our planet. And so I think it's a very exciting time because I think technology is caught up and we're finally going to be able to answer these really big questions. Thank you.